All right. We are going to um, go to lock. Um, we are about to move into free will. Let me back up just one slide where I have this kind of open question about understanding where we ended last class. The difference between primary and secondary qualities. Um, and really what I want to do is just open this up. Are there any leftover questions from last week's lesson on Locke that you have? Either about his argument against innate ideas, his positive view of empiricism and how sensation and reflection go into that, as well as his understanding of simple and complex ideas, and then finally, primary and secondary qualities. Were there any questions about that that I could address before moving forward? Then move forward, we shall do. Um, so in the first so kind of short section of the reading here was about free will. And what Locke does in this section is he essentially says the problem of free will is, a, is a, due to a conceptual misunderstanding. And we'll see how that plays out um, in a moment. Um, he starts off in this section by saying that human powers are essentially of two kinds. That you have the power to control your thoughts and you have the power to control your bodily motions. Um, and then any other power we describe about human beings reduces essentially to one or the other. Now, in his initial description of what it means to be free in section 8, he says, so far as a man has the power to think or not to think, to move or not to move, according to the preference or direction of his own mind, so far is a man free. So this actually gives, we're going to see a couple different definitions of freedom throughout this part of the book. Locke thought he was doing something really careful and precise in this section of the essay. A lot of commentators, his time and up till now, think what Locke is doing is very confused and hard to understand, and maybe even uh, he's contradicting himself at different times. I'm going to give you my interpretation of Locke here, but different philosophers have given different understandings of what's going on in these few pages here. I think everybody has agreed that what he's doing is, is trying to first identify two different powers. And the first power that he highlights in section 8 is the power of liberty. He thinks that humans have liberty, which is the power to do or refrain from any particular action according to the determination or thought of the mind. Um, so liberty is just your ability to do one thing or do another thing. And that you have that, un it's under your own kind of control whether you do the one thing or the other. The opposite of liberty is necessity. And this is also an important point as we look at the second power. That he thinks it's really, you get a clearer idea of what the power is in terms of its opposite. So necessity is when you only have, when there's only one possibility. When you can't act in any other way. There's only one choice on the table. So liberty is when you have multiple choices. Necessity, you got one and only one. So far, so good? Now this power of liberty is to be contrasted with volition. And this is what he takes up in section 10. If you have your books, let's open it up to 350 or 351, let's see. 350. And Locke gives a very famous example in this section. So um, pay attention and notice, um, I'm going to ask you about the example, and the example of a person locked in a room. Um, and I'll just read all of section 10. It's not a very long section on page 350. He says, again, suppose a man is carried while fast asleep into a room where a person is he longs to see and speak with and is there locked fast in beyond his power to get out. He awakes 
and is glad to find himself in so desirable company, which he stays willingly, prefers his stay to going away. I ask, is not this stay voluntary? I think nobody will doubt it. And yet, being lost fast in, it is evident that he is not at liberty not to stay. He does not have the freedom to be gone. So that liberty is not an idea belonging to volition or preferring, but to the person having the power of doing or abstaining to do, according to as the mind shall choose or direct. Our idea of liberty reaches as far as that power and no further. For wherever restraint comes to check that power or compulsion takes away that indifference of ability on either side to act or to refrain acting, their liberty and our notion of it presently ceases. So, question. And if we need to kind of retell the story, uh, apart from Locke's language, we can do that. But let's, let me just take a stab. What do you all think about this? Does the person in the locked room, does, he, does that person will voluntarily to stay there? Phil? Yes. Why do you say yes? He will voluntarily to stay because um, there's that other person in the locker room that he wanted to speak with for a long time. And so he does not want to leave that room. He wants to stay and talk to that person. Good. So it's voluntary because that's what he wants to do. Mm -hmm. um, does the person in the locker room have the power to leave the room? Yeah, go ahead, Phil. No. And why not? Because the room is locked. Right. What Locke is, that's, the, that's what Locke wants you to take away from this example. Oops. Okay. Um, what this is supposed to show us is that an act can be voluntary, meaning that you will it, but that does not show that the act is free or at liberty. So freedom or liberty is one kind of ability we have, one kind of power we possess, but willing is another kind of power, a different power. They're not one and the same thing. Otherwise, you couldn't have a case like the one we just read, where you have the ability to will something and yet not be free. Um, he gives some more examples. Like in section 11, he talks about a paralyzed man who wills to lay on the ground. I guess we're supposed to suppose there's a paralyzed guy, and it's sort of like he's comfortable there. He doesn't want to move. But in this case, um, he, it's voluntary because he wills to stay down there. That's where he prefers to be. But it's also a necessary action because he lacks the power to do anything else. It's not like if he wanted to get up and walk away, he could. He's stuck there. So with liberty, the, opposite, the co opposite of it was necessity. With volition or willing, the opposite of it is not necessity, but involuntary or unwilling. So, um, so when you think about voluntary actions, if somebody says it's not voluntary, don't think the act was necessary. Because you can have a voluntary act that's necessary, like the guy in the locked room or the paralyzed man. But you cannot have a voluntary act that is also involuntary. Those would be the opposites there. Does that make sense? Are there questions about this distinction? Because Locke thinks grasping this distinction is key to understanding this whole problem of free will. So when people say, like when we say well, we have more liberty, does that mean we want a greater range of freedoms than what we might want? So usually we say these sorts of things like in a political context, right? Um, and I think that's actually right. I mean, the way Locke would have us think about it is when we want more liberties, we want the ability to do more. Not necessarily to actually do more, we just want the possibility to do such things. Other questions? So this now gives us everything we need to bring it all together. How do we bring it all together? Um, well, this is maybe the shocking part, is that Locke says the will is not, a, is not free. <gasps> he doesn't believe in free will? Strictly speaking, yes. 
But that's because he thinks it's unintelligible to say that the will is free. He thinks that when people ask, is the will free? That people who ask that question are asking something that is completely absurd. It's like saying, is the number five red? Or is love, um, you know, is love, you know, ten pounds? <laughs> we can frame such questions grammatically, but they don't mean anything. Or they're absurd. They don't, they're not correctly formed. Locke is saying that when you ask, is the will free, you're asserting something that is absurd and ill-formed. That's because he believes that liberty is not something that belongs to the will. Freedom is not something that belongs to the will. It belongs to a person. You don't ask whether wills are free or not. You ask whether persons are free or not. Um, so the will is an attribute of an agent because the will is one of its powers. And likewise, liberty is one of the agent's powers. But, so when you ask, is the will free, what you're asking is whether one power, willing, has another power, being free. And he thinks that's crazy. That's like asking, can your perception have perceptions? Can your beliefs have beliefs? Or even better, can your perception have beliefs? Like, that would be weird to say any to ask any of those questions, right? You you don't say that your perception has beliefs or that your beliefs have perceptions. You say I have beliefs and I have perceptions. Those are two separate things I possess. They don't belong to one another. Likewise, I have the ability to will and I have the ability to act freely, but I don't but my will doesn't have the ability to act freely. So, it makes no sense whether your will, that is the power to choose, has liberty, which is the power to do or refrain from acting. And on his analysis, this is why the whole problem of free will has exists. The whole problem of free will is really due to a, a mistake in the way we think about it. If we apply sort of a careful way to think about willing and freedom, it dissolves the problem. <clears throat> so, the question, is the will free? That's unintelligible. Like I said, that's like saying, is, you know, what kind of cat is God? Um, it just doesn't make sense. It's an improper question. The right question, though, the one that really should concern us is, is a person free? Or when is a person free? That, he says, is, is asking the right sort of thing. And he answers this in section 21. He says, a person is free when he is at liberty to do what he wills. And he says in section 21, for how can we think anyone freer than to have the power to do what he will. Like, what more do you want? Thus, a free person is one who has liberty, the power to act or refrain from acting, to do what he wills to do. Now, on my analysis, that means the person in the, who is in that room with the, with the door locked is not free. <coughs> He can will, he has volition, but he's not able to do anything otherwise. He doesn't have liberty in Locke's sense. You can't act in any other way. So the person in the locked room is not an illustration of a, of a free person. It's an illustration of just a person who is exercising their, their will. Here's the way I want to the way I think about this issue for law. Um, you can think about it when you combine, so in the top division is the difference between liberty and necessity. When an agent has liberty, that agent has the ability to act or refrain from acting. Um, so in the, this would be somebody who's in the room and the room is not locked. They are able to stay in the room and they're able to leave the room. 
On the right hand side I have it where the agent lacks liberty. So this would be a case where the agent is in a locked room. There's no other choice they could make. Now, let's start on the, the right hand side where it's necessitated. When the act is necessitated, you're not free. So you can have a, a case where it is necessitated and not voluntary. Um, sorry, where it is necessitated and it's not voluntary. That would be like somebody who's thrown in jail. Somebody, at least most people who are thrown in jail, do not want to be in jail. That makes it not voluntary. If they would rather do something else than sit in a jail cell. But the person who's in jail also is there by necessity, which means even if they wanted to, even if it were the case they wanted uh, to, to leave, they couldn't leave. Like the, the bars necessitate that they have to sit there in the jail cell. There's no other possibility for them. The next one here, it would be like somebody who's in that locked room that Locke describes, where somebody is there voluntarily, like that's what they want to do, that's what they will to do, but there's no other possibility for them. They can't will to do anything. Uh, even if they will to do something else, they have to stay in that locked room. And for that reason, I would say the person is not free. Now, in the next two cases, we have it where they have liberty, where they can do one thing or the other thing. They're not stuck doing exactly one thing. In that, so, in this case, this is kind of a weird one, where the act is not voluntary, but you could do something other than what you actually do. Does anybody, can anybody think of a case that would be like that? Where you can choose, where you have the ability to do one thing or the other, but your choice is not voluntary. Will? I'd say like maybe homeless people purposely committing a crime to be in prison during winter months when they have voluntarily done something differently, but like they chose to do that way, and then our actions are restricted based on their initial choice. Why do you think that it's not a voluntary act in that case? Because you've got to freeze to death. You know what I mean? Like given it's not really voluntary, like you know, what choice do you have? So given that this, the that the only alternative is like freezing to death, you know, maybe you could say that that it really wasn't a voluntary thing. Maybe they don't want. You could argue. That maybe these are like I noble. They don't want to do it, but yeah. it's the best possible solution to their problem. Yeah, that might be the kind of thing he has in mind. Um. Anyone have any other thoughts? I think that might work. Yes, sir? Like coming to class, like we chose to take this class, and then like coming to class, like we can get like kind of taken off. So like, like kind of not voluntary. <laughs> Is that what you think about this class? <laughs> <laughs> Just like any class yeah. that has like a restriction on like um, attendance. Yeah. That might be the, the kind of case he has in mind as well, where there are very strict rules or consequences, and that makes it a lot like Will's case, where those consequences are so harsh that there's a sense in which you don't really want to do that, but you could do otherwise. I was thinking also of a case maybe, I mean, this is even a weirder case, but like where you might have a seizure and suppose that you have a seizure, but the kind of event is like a quantum event where the seizure could cause you to act in one of two different ways. So maybe in one version of the seizure that you could do, it would be like you throwing up. Lovely thought, I know. And the other one is just where you like flop on the floor for a while and, um, you know, or that's the form your seizure takes. You could do, let's say, one or the other. Like physically, the, quant you know, the, the quantum indeterminacy in your body makes it such that either event could take place. But whether you do the one or the other is not under your control. You don't will one or the other. Just one or the other is going to take place, and um, it takes place against your will. But maybe, like what I think some of this, what the examples that y'all are bringing are the ones most of my students do, and I think that might actually be a more easier to grasp kind of example. And then finally, the far left hand side, I think that's the only true case where Locke would say you are all thoroughly free. So when you have liberty, you're able to do one thing or the other thing, and it is also voluntary. 
so that when uh, you will to do that action. And this would be like a case where, um, you know, most of the cases where we do think we're free. So that if you choose to, you know, get pizza at lunch, um, you it's what you want to do, and you could have gotten, you know, hamburgers or a salad or whatever else instead. Um, so it is free when you have both liberty and voluntariness for the action. Any questions about Locke on free will? This would be, if you had any questions about any passage on 350 to 352, um, this is your place to ask. <coughs> or if there's anything I can try to clarify this, if you have any what-if questions for Locke on free will. Yeah, Alex? So, like, where would, like, slavery be in this? Presumably, the sla slaves are both, they both follow necessity and involuntariness. We can get, I mean, you, we could argue, some people might say some of the slaves maybe, maybe had a choice. Like, you, maybe they, so think of like a case where a slave owner doesn't really enforce, like, their slavery. It's just sort of like a psychological thing. So the slaves really wanted to get up and leave, they could. But maybe they're like so psychologically conditioned they don't think to do that. You might get into some weird cases like that. But for the most part, I think that we say they can't act otherwise because they've either got chains around them or there's like the threat of death if they try to leave. So it don't it makes so there's no real other possibility. And furthermore, we typically think slaves aren't don't do so voluntarily, that they would rather do something else with their life than that. Well, the person that can walk through them. Yeah. Could you just imagine the planet Earth, I guess, as a bigger version of a locked room on a different scale? Can you still have liberty in the locked room to do what we want? Right. And so very few people like, you know, Alan Shepard, you know, and Buzz Aldrin, Neil Armstrong, they get to, they're the only ones who've had, like, the freedom to leave this terrestrial ball. And Locke would say you're, that with regard to the choice of whether to be on Earth or not on Earth, most of us don't have the liberty to, at, with regards to that. Like 99.9999999999% of human beings, actually need more nines than that, have no liberty with respect to the choice of being on Earth or not. So liberty in that case would be relative to the choices you have to make or, or the act of being on Earth or not being on Earth. So whenever you ask, do you have liberty with Locke, or really with any philosopher, you ask, the way you flesh out, you say, with respect to what? With respect to whether I'm a human being or not? I don't think I have choice over that. What's that? Well, like, I feel like, well, there's no way you'd be free from laws of physics. Mm -hmm. So is that... And that would be another one. We had, we're not at liberty to, you know, change the laws of physics. Not at liberty to change the past. We're not at liberty right now to uh, get, you know, Gwyneth Paltrow and uh, oh, what's his name, Chris Martin, back together again. Um, they can't make it. I don't know if we can. Um, so those would be the sorts of things. Like we, had, I think everybody would say we just have no control over those things. So we're not at liberty with them. But you do have. Some say in things like, you know, what clothes you wear, what you know, what you choose to eat for lunch, whether, um, you know, whether you're going to do the homework or not, those kinds of things. So are you really afraid? Why would you say not? Say I wanted to fly. I can't. That's true. I don't know. So freedom doesn't, shouldn't apply to just literally anything. We're not God, right? We don't have the ability to just do whatever we want. So with certain things, we're not absolutely free. And usually the way philosophers think about this is not whether we have absolute freedom, because we certainly don't, but whether we have any freedom at all. And that's been usually the issue, because the people who are on the other side of this argument, the determinists, say not that most everything is determined and you might be free with a few things, they say you're free with respect to nothing. So 
to refute the uh, alternative, all you have to show is that there is some subclass of choices that we have that we are free. And it's, often students find it a little depressing when we study these things. They find out that free will probably is much more limited in scope than we thought. We actually spent a lot more time on this topic in my intro class, for those of you that were in that. And if you like this topic, there's a lot of things I can recommend for you to read that would be in line with uh, this topic for your paper. Any other thoughts on free will? Yeah, Phil? So before you were saying that uh, we could be free in one respect, but not another. Like, we could not be free by being in the locked room, but we could be free in choosing a turkey sandwich rather than a ham sandwich. Mm -hmm. In one sense, it's just a matter of thinking through these categories and saying, is the act at liberty or necessity? And is the, is, it an act, is the act voluntary or involuntary? And as we work through that, work through those questions, that tells you where you land on the grid. Mm -hmm. I think we've used this example before, but uh, with the drowning child. Yeah. Like you have the choice, to, but you're most likely going to save the child. So, <coughs> lot, this is where a lot of philosophers, where Locke doesn't have much to say on the extent of like how free you have to be psychologically. So, like, you see the child drowning in the mud on your way to school. Hopefully, you don't have it within you to just turn the other way and just keep going, right? I mean, hopefully, you are constituted such that if you see another human being that will inevitably die without you, you know, just giving a little bit of your time, you're going to stop and help. And hopefully, you do so almost like it's compelled by your nature, so you couldn't do anything differently. But... <laughs> Once you go that route, then you have to say, well, was it really a free action if you're compelled by your nature to do it? Locke doesn't have much to say about that. And you might wonder, this is where in the, so the top category isn't always clear. So by the top category in that scenario, would you be at liberty to save the child? Or would that be more like it's voluntary but necessitated? And if it falls under that category, that almost seems to violate the way that we think about, you know, we tend to think that would be a free action. So how important is the first distinction for freedom? It's these kinds of problems that have made the philosophical topic of free will, you know, worthy of a class in its own right. <laughs> yeah? In the case of the child... Uh, drowning, as bad as it sounds, wouldn't we be at liberty to not save them? Why would you say that? Well, some people, I mean, I guess some people could be so, like you said, psychologically, if they're, maybe if they're, if they have some kind of, like, condition where that might be, I don't know how to describe it really, but we do have the ability, we don't, there isn't any other there is other things that we could do. Mm -hmm. We could just continue. We could choose to ignore it. Although most people wouldn't, because we would want to see a person live. Yeah. We still have the ability to ignore it if we really wanted to. So as long, I mean, that, in a way, this is the other thing: is to settle these questions. Maybe we can't settle them as philosophers. Maybe we have to bring in a psychologist or you know a neuroscientist or somebody in to help us figure out what do we really have control over. Um, so maybe we really do have, as we have control over those kinds of cases. Maybe we're strongly compelled to help, but not necessitated. Like we really could, you might say, I really could walk past that child. I won't choose to do it, but I could do it. Yeah. yeah I was going to get along these lines, because like sociopaths mm -hmm. um, have That's less okay. blood flowing to certain parts of their brain. Right. So they're more, they have more liberty, but they're, they're thinking less <laughs> about it. And, Which is odd. and then you have to wonder, is that what we, if that's what it takes, suppose that we're in the child drowning case, it really is necessary, and though it would be like this, do we really want that to be a free act then? <laughs> it's almost like you would rather it not be free, but voluntary. And some people read Locke this way, that really what they think Locke really wants is not liberty, but just voluntariness, that if it's something that you want to do, that's really all it takes to get praise or blame.
Any final thoughts on the free will issue before we move on to substance? I, think I, I feel like that example is like, it's a good one because I, I wouldn't know where to put, like obviously we, it would be voluntary to do that, but I wouldn't know where to put it if it has liberty or if it's necessitated. Mm -hmm. And that's the other thing is that whether something is at liberty, just like the guy in the locked room, you don't know these things just by reflecting on your state of mind. The guy in the locked room, if you were to, he doesn't know the door's locked. How would he be able to, so he does, he's not in a position to tell if he is at liberty or not. So if I'm right, if this is the right way to think about lock on free will, whether an act is truly free in that far category is something we wouldn't be able to determine just by reflecting on our choices. You'd have to have some outside study to kind of assure you that you really could have done otherwise. Mm -hmm. I have a question. I don't know if this applies or not. I've been like throwing it back and forth in my head. But I was in mass once, and the priest was asking a question, and he basically stated, like as an example, the guy who works at drawbridge looks it up and down. There's a guy a mechanic working on the gears, but there's a boat coming. Mm -hmm. So if he, it's his job to lift the bridge up. If he lifts the bridge up, he saves the people on the boat, but the guy in the gears dies. Right. But if he doesn't, the guy working on the gears lives, but everyone on the boat's going to die. How would that fall into play with this? So this would be, this would be, I think, a paradigm example of, of, of a free choice. Because you can come up with good reasons to do one thing or the other thing. Usually, the cases that are most clearly identifiable as free choices are ones where you can come up with good reasons to do one or the other. I think we, we worry where cases where it's clear cut, you got to do the one thing, that psychologically you're compelled. What that case actually raises in a lot of ways is more about the question of um, our role in bringing about harm to others. Some people are inclined in that case to think, because if you're operating the drawbridge, if you push the button and you kill the guy at the gears, that's, you, it, that's the worst thing you can do because you've like played a role in bringing about his death. Your agency brought that about. But if you do nothing, if like you just kind of stand back and you just let nature take its course and the people on the boat die, even though more of them die, some people say that's better because you didn't play an active role in killing them. And so this raises sort of an issue more about value, which is about human rights. Do, human, do humans have a, what is stronger, their right to not be harmed? So that'd be the right of the guy working on the gears. Or the right to prevent people from being harmed, which would be the people on the boat. And in some versions of the story, uh, a lot of people think that the guy working on the gears, his rights trump the people on the boat. And other people, their intuitions go the other way around. It's kind of a cool example. I'm, I'm glad you, you heard that before, because like, I, I didn't know, I remember hearing that when I was like 10 years old, and I didn't know if it applied to this or not, and I was like, I didn't want to ask, but <laughs> I figured I'd ask anyway. Mm -hmm. What about in like the case of someone who is like mentally impaired and like does like a crime like kills someone? Would that be like a free action? If they if the mental impairment necessitates their action, then it would fall on this side of the graph. Now the question would be if they do it voluntarily or not. So suppose they do it voluntarily. This then raises the issue of whether for moral assessment, for moral praise and blame, does it really? Do you really need to have liberty, or can we just pass moral praise and blame just on the voluntariness well, of the why act? Why would you say they wouldn't? They would. They wouldn't have liberty because they they have more liberty because they're open more to do more things. It depends on the mental impairment. The way I imagine it was almost like there's a an issue that determines. It's like the mental impairment caused them to like do the action. Oh, right. I was thinking more the mental impairment allowed them to yeah. do the action. So they were more like a sociopath where they could almost do one thing or the other a little more easily. Yeah, some people have like a, a like a, some people have tumors that right. cause them to, to do an action like that. So that would be necessitated probably. If you had it on that version, it would be necessitated. Right. On maybe the way you're talking, maybe that would open up the possibility for it being free as well. Because sociopaths, <coughs> sociopaths can function just like any other yeah. human. They just are much more open. 
If you want to take a real strong view on free will, there's a philosopher named Immanuel Kant. Hey, we're going to read him at the end of the semester. Um, he thinks that you're only really free for things that you don't want to do. Like, you have no motive to do them. So, like, if you're going to go on a date with somebody, and let's say they want to watch, like, a terrible movie like The Notebook. Um, you are only free, like, you only exercise freedom with that choice if you don't want to watch that movie. You have no motive to do so. And there's a sense in which some people really get this. You're like, yeah, like that. The fact that you made the choice to watch this terrible movie shows that you exercise free will. There's no, re you had no reason to watch it. Now, if you watch the movie because that's like your favorite movie, you didn't do it by, you didn't do it freely. You had a motive. You had a reason to do it. Now, if you put it this way, though, um, on Kant's view, get, you're free with very, with respect to very few choices. It's hard to, in fact, some would argue you're free with regard to no choices, because some would say it's incoherent for you to make a choice without a motive for picking it. If you're interested in these things, um, you know, look, I'm, I'm considering doing a whole course on free will sometime in the near future, so you can always look for that. Or you can major in philosophy and think about these things all the time. Um, other interesting examples or problems with free will? Or specific passages from Locke in here that I that you you need clarified or explained that I've not gone over. Yeah. I mean, can we maybe pr get a an example of? I know we kind of did one for having liberty, yeah. but not voluntary. Yeah. Maybe in the strictest case, here would be an, maybe another one. These are always hard to come up with, but. You get robbed, like at gunpoint. They say, your money or your life. There's maybe, you maybe are at liberty to give him your wallet or to run or attack him, but given the fact there's like a gun in your face, if you hand over your wallet, you're not really doing it willingly. You're doing it sort of, you know, um, against your will. That might be... So that might be a case where you are at liberty to do one thing or the other, but the action you choose to do is against your will. But wouldn't you be voluntarily giving him your wallet instead yeah. of giving him your... That, that, I, I, I hate to be that. I think this is where it gets complicated because you might say, all things considered, since you don't want to lose your life, you actually willingly choose to hand it over. There's a, there is a sense in which you can say, yeah, the act was done willingly. Like, I get, I get this sense of... I get the sense of liberty in that in that situation where you could you could like you said run away attack or you know or give the wallet up, but then it's kind of confusing that you give him your wallet instead of running away or attacking, mm -hmm. and it's not voluntary that you do that because I feel like it would be voluntary to give the wallet instead of like running or attacking. I think maybe the other way to do this is kind of. Like I was, the weirder case I originally gave, which is like, there's a <coughs> quantum event in your brain where one thing or the other thing could happen. Like, it's not determined. So you could have a seizure where you throw up, or you could have a seizure where you flop on the ground. Um, but which one takes place is not according to your will. You know, one, whatever happened, either one could take place, but the one that takes place doesn't follow your choice. So it's just sort of like a random event that happens to you. Do you have the, in that case, do you have the liberty to have or not have the seizure? No. <laughs> so whether you have a seizure or not is ne is necessitated. Whether it's this kind of seizure or that kind oh, of okay. seizure. Okay. Or if I, maybe there's, make the quantum event such that you either have the seizure or you don't have it. But still, you have no control. You don't will to have it or not have it. Or right. you certainly don't will to have it. Okay. Yeah. Um, well, I don't know if this makes sense, but like for being pregnant, like people have the ability to either, you know, have sex or refrain from it, but then the act of the growing a baby is not voluntary. 
So with regard to like conception, not like getting yeah. pregnant. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> so we have choice. We have the at least the ability to choose whether we we engage in sex or not. At least in, at least consensual sex. And then we but we have no control over conception. <laughs> Alex. I was just going to say, for the, the quantum event, wouldn't you not really have the liberty? Because whatever is going to happen is, isn't really within your range of choice. It's just a possible event. So, so it's not under your control whether the one event or the other takes place. Yeah. That might be right, so then I might still have another problem here. I would say at least on one way to understand his notion of liberty, that either it happens or it doesn't happen, either one is possible. But maybe, I mean, the way actually he defines liberty, maybe you're right, because he talks about it sort of being under your, sort of according to your mind, according to your choice. So maybe, maybe I have to think of a better example. Which may mean I have to come back to these ones like getting robbed or having, you know, somebody like compel you to do something. But um, I think this category is the hardest one to understand. Yeah? And like for me, like a simpler example, you have the ability to choose to eat lunch or to not eat lunch, but your possible choices for eating are limited. And there are only so many things, like you, know, you walk in the cafeteria and you're married, you're mm -hmm. limited to the choices that the cafeteria has made for you. You can choose to go in there or not, but once you go in there, you're limited. So you might be... <laughs> so e <laughs> Listen, eating in... Whether you eat in the cafeteria or not is at liberty. Once you go in there and you're like, oh, crap, all they have is this. Yeah. I don't want to eat this, but I already paid, so... Um. <laughs> I mean, but you... <laughs> I guess you could walk out and not eat anything, even though you already paid. It's not like you're, you have to eat the food. But I think that's just the way to cash. <laughs> what if it, maybe the, the case would be something like this, where you, you're put into a jail cell, you think it's locked, but it's actually not locked. Like, you hear it clang shut, but you never go check. And so you sit in that jail cell the whole time saying, I wish I could get out of here. That would be an act that is not voluntary, because you would not choose to do that. But it actually turned out to be, at liberty, you just never checked the door. <laughs> so it was a trick. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, that's maybe enough free will for today. Let's, uh, <laughs> let's take about a, about a ten minute break. So when the clock says uh, 7.35, we'll pick up again.